Hello everyone, this is Robert from Just Players Made Better. I know I'm kind of late to the party with regards to um, showing this game, but I really liked this game when it came out in, uh, I believe it was early June, between Ferruja and Kartikayan. And what I found interesting about this game is that Kartikayan sacrificed his queen extremely early in the game for just two minor pieces. Um, not what people would classically consider full compensation for a, a nine-point piece, the queen or some people say 10, but either way, two minor pieces is generally not regarded as sufficient uh, compensation for the queen materially, but black obtained a very nice position, and I wanted to just explain my perspective on the kind of counterplay and compensation that black obtained, and then examine uh, the great technique that Karthikayan demonstrated in taking it from move 9 to the end of the game with a full point for black. We start with the King's Indian, which is a very dynamic opening for black. It seems that these days it's quite common for black to accept a position with less space and maybe objectively a slightly worse position, but some chances of counterplay. Since in the lines which are more symmetrical, um, white generally retains some kind of pleasant first move advantage. So the King's Indian is pretty uh, popular as a response to d4. Typically, white might play knight f3, and then we would see something like castling bishop e2. There are lots of ways to play, but this is the historical uh, or historically most common line. And black will play e5. Anyone who's not familiar with the king's Indian, this e5 move is tactically justified by a transference to a favorable endgame for black if white just tries to trade everything and then take this hanging e pawn. I want to bring everyone's attention to this formation because it's not the last time we're going to see it in this game even though this variation is not how black played whenever you see this kind of configuration this pawn is generally off limits and the pawn is also pretty strong because when it moves this bishop is going to reveal its full power along the long diagonal this is observable in openings like the dragon sicilian um the king's indian and a few other Fianchetto systems, such as the Modern Defense or Peart's Defense. Now, here, <clears throat> if white plays queen takes d8, rook takes d8, knight takes e5, black can respond with the counterstroke, knight takes e4, recovering the piece. One way that the game could continue is with knight e4, bishop takes e5, bishop g5, bishop takes b2, rook b1, and rook e8. This is generally considered to be slightly better for black, despite their slightly lower development. Anyway, this isn't what happened in the game. I just wanted to show mostly um, this interesting formation because it's going to appear again, and it's a common feature of all the King's Indian lines, not just this one where white played h3, a very flexible, interesting alternative to the more common lines with knight f3. After bishop e3, which was prepared with h3, we don't want to see knight g4 attacking the bishop. Usually trading your bishop for a knight early in the game is not so good. Um, black opted instead of for the normal King's Indian structure to play c5, which is more like a Benoni system. And white can take twice here, but practice has shown that black gets a quite excellent position. Anyway, let's focus more on knight f3, which is played in the game. It seems like white was maybe cruising for some sort of um, Morotse bind type structure. You know, they want to play kind of like a Morotse against a Dragon Sicilian, which is kind of like what we, we might have after pawn takes d4 here, knight takes d4, and white is pretty comfortable. They have a clamp where they have prevented effectively the d5 break. They've prevented the b5 break since there's so much support on that square, including from the knight and the bishop. And they also have good control of f5. So I think all around white would be pretty comfortable. So that might have been what they wanted. But Kartikayan played queen a5 here. And if I'm not mistaken, this uh, system of development had been studied by King's Indian players um, in the past. But it has not occurred in practice yet. This is the first instance. Maybe that's part of why this game... Um, wasn't being celebrated, you know, in every village and every town in the entire country 
probably some people are like, yeah, yeah, that's a King's Indian line. We already know. But it was interesting to see it actually come to life. Anyway, White played knight d2. Someone that I showed this game to suggested the move bishop d3 here. And I found it interesting to find after pawn takes d4, knight takes d4, White gets the Marozzi structure that they want, but this bishop is misplaced on d3. After, for instance, knight c6 and castling, the black is already equalized. And if they tried to play a move such as knight c2 to avoid trading, which is a standard um, technique to capitalize on a spatial advantage like what white has here, um, black would play knight d7 and they're already better because their knight will come to c5 where it stands very well. We'll also see that in the main line of our game today. And also this bishop will radiate its power along the long diagonal, another um, aspect of our, our game's theme today. Um, but in those lines, black did not sacrifice a queen. So one can imagine how good that position must be if black could sacrifice a queen in order to get a position where the bishop is open and where there's um, some influence on the c3 square. Anyway, so knight d2 was maybe more accurate. The bishop on f1 maybe wants to go to g3. I'm sorry, to g2 after g3. Black took on d4. And for a few years, people have been playing this fancy response, knight b3. You know, they have two pieces under attack, but they don't want to merely recapture. If they play bishop d4, black would get their knight to a good square pretty rapidly, since white doesn't really want to trade their bishop for a knight early in the game, like I mentioned. Um, seeding the bishop pair early on is just a cue for the side with the bishop pair, two bishops against one bishop, to open the position. So they're not going to trade it with a move like knight f3. And after knight d7, we again get this nice position. It might continue with rook c1 and knight c5. <clears throat> anyway, this is the part where the dramatic queen sacrifice occurred on move 9. I'm sure that um, Ferruja was surprised to see queen take c3, even if he had analyzed it before, since this, as far as I know, hadn't been played. It's also generally quite shocking to see your opponent just throw their queen away for two minor pieces like this. It's not very common. That's part of what made me want to make a video about this particular game. I found this queen sacrifice rather compelling, and I wonder if when we see maybe more games from Alpha Zero or some other future neural network technologies, if we will see maybe a pattern where in certain types of positions, certain pawn structures, this queen sacrifice is actually typical among the high level um, computer players. At any rate, they have to accept this queen. And capturing on c3 would be a mistake because you only get one piece for the queen. So of course they played d takes e3. This is maybe the first critical juncture because White can decide to capture on e3, play a move like f3, or do something completely different. But it turns out that in all cases, black has um, very good play for the queen. They have material compensation. They have two minor pieces, a knight and a bishop. They also have a favorable minor piece balance. They have two bishops against one bishop. So as the position opens up, the dark square bishop will be essentially unopposed. Um, and they also have a good pawn structure. So it seems like the sum of all these small advantages is about tantamount to a, a minor piece, or at least the difference between a queen and two minor pieces. In this position, white chose to play f3. Usually putting all of your pawns on the same color of your bishop spells disaster for that bishop, and I think that kind of was illustrated in this game which might naturally suggest to anyone watching this that, well, why don't they just take the pawn? Besides, a pawn is a pawn. It's good to take a free pawn. Well, it's not exactly free. Black would too easily get compensation for their material because after knight takes e4, we can see that the bishop is influencing the long diagonal. The knight is on an ideal square. It's an outpost square because no pawns can ever chase it away. And moreover, the knight is attacking c3 with full force as well. I looked at a couple of replies. One is rook c1, and after knight c6, knight d2, 
knight g3, it seems like white is just getting overrun. Even if they have um, supposedly better pieces or more quality pieces, black's pieces all have extremely good squares to go to. So even if they are fewer or weaker, they are able to do more concretely in this particular position. I think this is something that people often forget about when they're blank chest, that the piece values are made up. They're not something that is actually in the rules of chess. If you crack open a chess rule book, it doesn't say, and the queen is nine points, and the rook is five points, and the bishop is three, and the knight is three, and the pawn is one, or whatever. That's just something that people made up as a guideline. It's essentially like the center of the average value of the piece in all positions. But in every game that you play, you're going to reach a concrete position, something that has particular qualities, and you cannot depend on these generalities all the time. And the more dynamic and the more chaotic and the more unique the position gets, the more that these particular details matter. So I would say that playing f takes e3 would be giving black way more play for the queen than they deserve. In fact, there's, there's one more interesting thing I think I failed to mention. After the sample line that I've shown, which is not necessarily forced, but seems pretty forced, after knight e5, king f2, white's playing dynamically also to try to push back the black pieces and prevent them from attaining their best posts. Knight takes f1, queen takes f1 in order to overprotect c4. Bishop f5, e4, bishop e6. Black continues to have good squares. And I think that the c pawn is eventually going to fall. So first this pawn will come under attack, then this pawn will come under attack. It seems like white is just not catching a break. They have all these pieces, but they can't use them. It's interesting to note that the f pawn is on an open file, but it's easily protected by several pieces. I think it's obvious if you look at it. There's an open b file. The pawn on b7 is also easily protected. They could always just play b6. Um, and there are essentially no other weaknesses in black's territory, whereas every single pawn in white's camp is weak, and several of the empty squares are also weak. Um, there are a couple other interesting lines. One is knight d4. It might make sense to try to, say, block the attack on the c pawn. Um, and in some of the lines, if they play, like, knight takes c3 very early, then white gets a lot of play. I think maybe a move like queen c2 or queen b3 is quite appealing here. Um, it's, I don't think the knight's even necessarily going to come back from something like this. So black doesn't really want to go around hunting material. They want to increase their activity. This is a common way of playing with a material imbalance like this. If your pieces are very active, you should increase your activity rather than hunting material. I mean, at some point you can cash in if it's just too good, but usually you have to build up some more initiative before that happens. Anyway, I think I went on a small tangent. After we were looking at knight to d4. I really like this bishop f6 idea that I found. After bishop f6, we're trying to play bishop h4 and start harassing this king. I would really like to play something like Let's say white is unaware, and they play rook to b1. Actually, no, rook b1 is a terrible move, because they could play knight c3 anyway and start getting material. How about rook c1, protecting the c-pawn? We might see a move like bishop h4 check. They can only go to e2. And then it's just pure brutality after knight g3. So the two minor pieces are on their best possible squares, and they have a lot of other good squares to choose from, which is why this counterplay is so formidable. I guess the question naturally arises, how does one see all this counterplay ahead of time? Well, of course, since this is an opening uh, queen sacrifice, it could have been prepared ahead of time. I'm certain that it was. So you could just do your homework. You could look at a position like this, get an idea to play a sacrifice, and analyze it to death. But there are also some sort of intuitive guidelines for what to do when you sacrifice a piece. You might want to ensure that your opponent has weaknesses. 
you might want to not capture the weak pieces immediately and just always put your pieces on the best squares. And only when your pieces are improved to the maximum start taking things. Um, and also there are certain uh, tactical motifs which are fairly common and obvious that you should be aware of if you're going to sacrifice pieces. Um, so here, black playing knight h5, people who don't like their knights on the edge of, of the board might be confused, but I think it's going to be pretty obvious why this is strong. After, for example, queen c1, bishop h6, g4, and knight f4. This happened in the game, and again, we have the same formation. I mean, it's not the same, but it's very similar. The bishop is supporting the knight, and there's a pawn in front of the knight. So if anything captures the pawn, there's going to be a disaster. For instance, queen takes e3. I think knight g2 will seal the deal. Bishop takes g2, bishop takes e3. Now um, black is just up material, significantly up material, and they still have the initiative. Grabbing material when you lose the initiative is not always great. It has to be really a lot of material, but most people feel much more comfortable when they have pieces in their hands, so... I guess that's why things like that happen. King d1 was played, and knight e6. I mentioned before that this formation is very strong, but it's important to note that the bishop on h6 is hanging. So if we play, for instance, knight c6, queen takes e3 is a brave move, but it does work. They can avoid any kind of tactics here. Like, if I tried knight g2 now, or something else like maybe knight e6 now, the bishop is just hanging. So that's why um, the timing of knight e6 is what it is but it also comes with a threat the threat is for instance if white plays an active move to play e2 check and since it's check they can't play queen h6 we might see bishop e2 bishop c1 and again black has a lot of material and that's nice so king c2 the king's on the run if you were calculating a variation that goes along these lines where you're down some material, but they just keep running and running and not doing anything productive, that's a good sign that your sacrifice gives you compensation. So I really feel like if I was analyzing this at home before the game, I'd be happy to see that they have to start, you know, awkwardly shifting their king around. And in a real game, if they're not super prepared, they're very likely to make some inaccuracies. Knight c6 is an active move. The knight is just going to head for its best square. And white also chose an active plan. If you're defending a position where you're much more passive, you need to try to get active as much as you can. The idea here is to limit the bishop. A move like, for instance, knight e5 would likely be met by g5. And the bishop is just not as impressive on g7, even though it is still very good. But they play bishop f4, maintaining all that dynamic potential. And now, again, with a threat. If white plays an active move here, like h5, then e2 is a discover attack once again. We would win a bishop. Now, queen d1 was played to avoid that fate, and the knight is now perfectly placed on e5. I think that black is already maybe better. I'll just show the conversion step. White started trying to blockade this e-pawn and, and maybe win it, but it was just too easy for black to develop the pieces. After bishop d7, a4 was played. The reason is that if you play something where you try to trade the pieces, for instance, knight e2, this just runs into a deadly skewer. The king is higher value than the queen. Once we move the king, the queen is lost. So black is just developing the pieces and creating threats effortlessly. a4 is intended to allow the rook to guard a4. But a4 is not objectively improving white's position, so white is definitely still on the, fully on the defensive. And now here comes here come the black rooks. White almost managed to trade all this stuff, but they started losing their critical squares in the process. Queen d3 was played, knight e5. So the annoying pawn on e3 has been won, but at a price. Some more pawns are being hemorrhaged. And the king itself will also come under attack, since it has no safe home. That's a natural byproduct of having um, a very poor pawn structure on all parts of the board. The king will probably be unsafe as long as pieces are left on. This actually reminds me of another important aspect of this. At several points, black could have permitted some exchanges of pieces, 
but this is not actually very good unless you get some excellent compensation in exchange. Because the fewer pieces there are on the board, the more powerful white's extra queen will become. You have to understand what the unique powers are of the pieces and play to their strengths if you are going to have some very imbalanced position like this. It's interesting that white didn't play queen takes a7. I believe that the reason that they didn't capture this pawn is because the queen will get locked in and become useless after bishop c6. Bishop c6 is threatening bishop takes e4 with a double attack. And if they play a move like um, maybe... I'm not even sure what to play here. Maybe like knight g3. Then knight c5 traps the queen. It's not going to get captured necessarily. It probably will though with rook a8. But at any rate, the queen is very useless there. So white wisely avoided snatching a pawn. And played queen f2. And black just improved the, the rooks and the minor pieces extremely efficiently. In this position, I think that many players would choose the move rook c8, just because it looks aesthetically pleasing. Like the rooks are together striking c3. We just have to move the bishop and the knight out of the way. But that would require a little bit of a concession, because this bishop is ideally placed. This knight is ideally placed. Why should we start moving all of them just to attack c3 in an obvious way? I really like how black recognized how their pieces are all on their ideal squares, including the rook on f8 and decide to make a pawn move. Usually you should only move your pawns when your pieces are ideal. If you go back through this video and watch the game again, you'll see that black did not waste any time moving the pawns after they sacrificed the queen. They brought all the higher powers to their best squares. So f5 is excellent. Um, it's improving the rook without even moving the rook. It's not always necessary to move a piece to make it better. And after pawn takes f6, bishop takes f6, White was essentially just dead lost. I also think many beginning players would not convert accurately. They would play rook takes f6, which is probably not bad, but it's not as precise as the move bishop f6. The threat of a discover attack on the queen is much more powerful than just blindly attacking the queen with the rook. That is demonstrated in the finale of the game. Here, um, you might want to pause and just imagine what you would do here as black to take advantage of your mighty position. All the pieces are ideally placed, so intuitively it seems like it might be time to strike. So just take a, a minute if you want. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead. After rook f1, black played bishop takes c3, an excellent move. If they capture the bishop, of course they're going to lose their queen. And since black has been steadily collecting pawns and other pieces for their queen, sacrificing the queen back is not really much of an option. That's also a good sign that the queen sacrifice should have worked in the first place. If you want to sacrifice a piece, but your opponent can easily return the piece in the next couple of moves, it's very unlikely that your sacrifice is sound. So here they play queen takes c5. Knight takes c5. I guess the reason is that if they move away, they're going to just be losing terribly anyway on material, as well as position. For instance, queen g3. Um, I think just bishop takes a1 is very strong. They're forced to play rook takes a1. And then knight c3 double check looks really good. Feels good to make a double check. So they decided to sacrifice their queen. But notice how the, these black pieces, they never are being put on a bad square, even when white is forcing the play. It's like every square on the board is good for these pieces. Rook takes f8 is basically forced. And after king takes c3, knight e5, the minor pieces are just dominant. It's interesting to note that black has a majority in every area of the board. I've heard that Kasparov liked to think of the board as separated into zones. There are two queenside pawns against one. That means that black could eventually transfer it into one against zero, a passed pawn. In the center, it's the same, two against one. And on the king side, it's also an identical two versus one majority. So you can kind of expect in a position like this that black will soon have at least one or two pass pawns and be able to win the game by dint of the pawn superiority. Um, I think there might be one thing that I had to 
mention here. Let me think. Bishop takes c3, queen takes c5. It's interesting to note that if they play a move like rook b1, we might encounter the move knight e3. So this double attack is what I wanted to highlight. It pops up in a couple of variations. So there's a lot of tactical background to this strategic sacrifice. Anyway, the rest of the game is just a wash, so I'll just play it more or less and fast forward for anyone who's curious. White uselessly maneuvered the remaining pieces for some time. The king is being improved. Anyone who has read an endgame book probably knows that as the pieces come off, generally the king gets stronger. I like to think that the king is about as strong as a rook, so let's not underestimate that guy. Um, and so black is using the king as an attacking force to go corral some pawns and create a pass pawn. I mean, we can't improve our position with just two minor pieces. They're already on their best squares. We have to improve the pawns. I like the small accurate moment here. Instead of king takes h4, or takes h7, king g4, or takes e7, where white has some counterplay, black eliminated that counterplay with h6. Even though they end up taking the h-pawn anyway, and it takes more moves than it would have otherwise, this is more precise, because it required white to work for the pawn. They played rook h7 here, going after the e-pawn, and after king takes h4, now they have to choose one pawn. They cannot take both the h-pawn and the e-pawn. So they took this one. And even though black would likely have a winning position after knight c6, Black also followed the general endgame wisdom that you shouldn't trade your bishop for a knight in the endgame. So they attacked the rook first and played bishop d5. And then here come the pass pawns. Again, we see um, good cooperation between the knight and the bishop. Here come those pawns. Bishop e4 is, I guess, just to have the option of trading this knight. Also to shelter the E pawn from the rook, and also to play d5, d4, all with tempo. White resigned shortly. So this is the end of a very interesting game, full of instructive moments. I highly recommend anyone to go and look over this video, and also maybe download this game and store it somewhere for your own enjoyment later on. You can find any chess game you want, even if you don't have uh, any database software on chessgames.com, or if you're lucky to have a membership or have paid for some software, you can search for it in Chessbase, or you can find it on chess.com or whatever. So um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment on this video. And if you like this, I have a lot of other content that I'd like to share. Um, but since chess is my sole profession at this moment in my life, I would really like it if people subscribed and I would like to I would share more of my videos and ideas and the chess games that I've seen over the last uh, five years of playing chess professionally um, with you. So I hope that you guys all enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think. I'd like to have some discussion with you guys about this game. Until next time, take care.